dear distinguished uh, panelists, uh, it's a great honor for me to host this uh, first webinar at the OE we, we, uh, Week uh, 2021, hosted by EDAN, the European Distan Distance and E-Learning Network. So Eden is hosting uh, webinars each uh, day of the week this week from the 1st of March to the 5th of March. And some days there are uh, also two webinars a day. So I will come back to that later on. <clears throat> the theme of this uh, webinar today is about the role of the openness in shaping of the post-pandemic education and the role of international associations. <clears throat> this really shows how important this webinar is because we have managed to gather all the global organizations and associations dealing with open and online e-learning and not at least the post-pandemic uh, next normal, what will come in the future. So we have a 90 minutes uh, webinar and it will be a presentation from our distinguished panelists. There will be a discussion and there are possibilities to raise questions in the Q&A and also to uh, uh, participate in the chat. And also please uh, use the chat to write where you are from, but strict questions will be in the Q&A. So we have, um, of course, Eden, the president, Sandra, <coughs> Sandra um, Christina Softik, the president of Eden. We have the president of ICDE, International Council for Distance and E-Learning Network, Nay Fasina. We have the Vice President from OE Global, Lena Patterson. We have um, the Secretary Direct the Director Secretary, uh, George Bubax from EIDTU, European Associations, Association for Distant Teaching Universities. We have the Vice President from UCAN, the European University Continuing Education Network, Lena Sandon. We have Michael Gable from the European um, University Association. We have Ashka Kambar, coming from Commonwealth of Learning, the President of Commonwealth of Learning. And we have Seinep, Seinep Baraglu from UNESCO, who is responsible for the OER Dynamic Coalition. So we have eight distinguished panelists for this session. And I am as myself, I am the moderator. I am Ebba Janelson. I am professor in innovation and open online learning. And I have had the honor for many, many years to work with uh, all of the associations and all the persons behind the organizations. I am in the Eden EC executive committee, and I'm also sharing the uh, Eden uh, special interest group on uh, child and quality enhancement. I'm also in the ICDE EC and the sharing there, the OER Advocacy Committee. I have been uh, in the UK EC for many years, two, peris, two, two periods in 2004 and 2008. And I'm working, as I said, with uh, all of the organizations for different kind of purposes. So it's a great honor and great pleasure for me to host this uh, webinar. And I hope you will uh, find it of interest and that you also actively take part in the discussion and raise questions. <clears throat> so
So um, after this short introduction, which is really an honor for me uh, to be together here with you, uh, I will um, give the, the floor to the panelists and I will do so in alphabetic order for the organization, except for the first one, because I would like to start with Eden, as Eden is the host of uh, this webinar series and for the session today. So I will start to give uh, each of the panelists have first five minutes to give the overview of the questions we had have raised uh, in the information of this webinar and that they have chosen to focus on some of the, the questions or issues. So I will first uh, give the floor to uh, the president of Eden, Sandra Christina Softik. Thank you. Thank you, Eba. Hello, everyone. First of all, greetings from Eden. I'm really happy and honored that we were able to have this session today. I wish to thank the panelists for joining me and joining EBA uh, in this first session uh, within the European, uh, within Eden uh, Open Education Week. I think that uh, by joining uh, such uh, distinguished association, we are showing important importance of open education, of openness in science, uh, and in education, and definitely uh, giving the right direction that uh, openness uh, is, should be something which is on agenda of all uh, countries, uh, nevertheless it's Europe or on a global, global level. Uh, definitely, we are facing challenging years. So last year, we started with the COVID crisis. Uh, we are still facing this crisis even uh, today. But the issue of openness and open education has become even more important now than ever. Although openness and open education is nothing new, I think that we still have the issue how to enhance the uh, possibility, uh, accessibility, uh, equity to education for all uh, citizens uh, in this world. Uh, definitely, um, number of uh, statement, numbers of policies, number of documents have been prepared regarding the open education. We have seen already a uh, number of good case examples, uh, knowledge has been shared, but still we have the issue with uh, open education. Eden is fostering open education uh, and supporting uh, as a, in a way of being, uh, I would say, uh, uh, community of practice uh, where you can share and uh, find uh, important resources. Um, we have joined the open education uh, movement five years ago. This is our fifth uh, open uh, education week. And also we hope that uh, by joining our efforts, we can uh, give a strong message that we have to en uh, enable the possibility that each of us has the right and possibility uh, for education. And whether it's formal or non-formal education. And uh, here today, uh, we can start uh, with this strong message uh, by uh, all of us showing a good example how openness and open uh, education can be uh, available, uh, used, reused, uh, and uh, with five are already uh, reshaped and on all, in all possible ways. Uh, Eden has been doing uh, openness uh, with its work. Uh, we are celebrating 30 years uh, this year. For a number of years, we are doing open education. So all our materials, all our resources, all our events are recorded and open in a public uh, way. So it's they are open uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, access. Uh, whether these are webinars, uh, whether these are uh, the uh, proceedings, uh, whether these are blogs or our URODL, uh, our newsletter, or um, these are uh, proceedings for the research workshops. So we are having a number of things to share. And I would say that each of us uh, as association have lots of issues to share. This is actually the, the gold. <laughs> we are we are sitting on on, on the on the uh, uh, on the gold, which has to be uh, visible, and available, and shared to everyone. And uh, with these words, I 
I open the, the, this webinar and the floor for other panelists. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Sandra, for this uh, introduction and for <clears throat> this uh, information about what Eden is doing in the field. Uh, so I will now give the floor to um, George Ubats from EADTU. We are still waiting for uh, Asha from Commonwealth of Learning, so I will uh, sweep a bit. So if you are ready, uh, George, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Eva and Sandra. Uh, yeah, uh, let me look at this uh, at this topic from the viewpoint of um, uh, online education from also MOOC providers. As you know, ED2 is also the coordinator of the European MOOC uh, consortium, and we are very active in bringing uh, open education to the to the labour market. Um, and this event is about creating access to education, uh, valuable education, meaning quality assured, relevant, and recognised. And as you know, since 2013, the MOOC platforms offer MOOCs in collaboration with universities, and they are designed by innovative pedagogies and accessible to all anywhere for free. Um, certainly, the number of students over the past uh, 10 years um, uh, show that there is a real interest in open education and, um, and the real need. So recently, we have within the uh, European MOOC consortium, the platforms, are now collaborating with universities um, and to start working on, on MOOC pathways for continuing education and professional development. Uh, so we are increasingly co-creating this with the sectors and businesses. So uh, even if there's open education, um, it's, uh, uh, we are still looking for making them uh, in collaboration more relevant for the labor market. Um, who are the, the MOOC learners? The, um, uh, the learners here, uh, it shows that about 75% of the MOOC users are people who are in jobs. They are looking uh, for increasing their skills, uh, for uh, for uh, being um, educated for a new job, reskilling and upskilling. So uh, all with the goal of, um, of further career development by open education. To better support now the uh, labor market goals of these students, uh, recognition is becoming more and more important uh, than ever. It is uh, needed to, to prove the reskilling and upskilling, visible and transparent on quality, subjects covered, and the workload. So, for the learners, it is important that it is very clear and transparent in what they, what they put their time and efforts in and make clear what they have gained on competencies, at what level and uh, related workload. So, in short, the value of the upskilling and reskilling. And this in itself is also a trigger for further education and sets a clearer pathway of uh, continued education. Um, the uh, European MOOC Consortium partners have uh, started uh, about two years ago with creating this um, uh, micro-credential, what is needed to, to indicate the value of the continued education in what we call the Common Micro-Credential Framework. And uh, it is a, a qualification that relates to uh, an average of five ECTS um, level six, seven uh, or eight, and which is uh, quality assured and um, uh, it, it has all the specs that are needed to, to indicate the value also on the workload of the study. But next to formalizing the recognition, we need to better serve the labor market also by, by MOOC platforms, establishing connections with the sectors and companies. So next to the, the recognition, we have to look at the relevance. And the relevance is um, by collaboration with, with sectors and companies. So we, uh, the MOOC platforms then start to operate as an interface between universities and companies, uh, labor organizations, to be more demand-driven, more relevant and timely in offering. And, and uh, therefore, uh, they offer company spaces, white label platforms um, to, uh, with a purpose for internal training of staff by organizing a suite of MOOCs and meaningful pathways for learners. The most successful are the ones that are actually co-created um, with, with the sector. Uh, we had uh, two uh, conferences uh, on labor market developments and the use of, uh, of open education. Uh, in the past uh, half year, actually. And in this context, we established a structure of collaboration between uh, MOOC platforms, universities, employment agencies, companies, and sector representatives to, to connect um, open education uh, to continued, edu um, continued education. Uh, for all the parties we have, uh, we were able to formulate a kind of a message on how they can contribute by open education to the labor market. And for the MOOC providers, um, the message is as follows. 
the MOOC platforms and universities start collaborating with private and public labor market organizations, sectors, enterprises, ministries, and public agencies. They deliver and co-create with these organizations MOOCs and MOOC pathways for employment and innovation, which after assessment are awarded with a common with a micro credential. These are stackable to wider certified programs and academic degrees. And due to the crisis, the COVID crisis, more and more people have to change from a particular sector to another branch of, of business. So micro credentials can facilitate this by retraining people. Um, in, uh, in closing, my, my contribution here is that um, we see also that the university alliances are picking uh, this up. Uh, universities in, in general are picking up the um, open education for continued education. And these new developments in open education will lead to further innovation of new educational formats and pedagogies, as well as new ways of collaboration, uh, improving the quality and relevance of the offerings for better coverage of European wide labor market. The recognition of continued education by micro credentials is needed to further formalize these new offerings of short programs and integrate them in the uh, in the educational system. So you see really a connection there of, of open education becoming part of the educational system by making um, uh, the, the labor market parties aware of uh, the role open education can play in continued education. And that is what we as EDTU and uh, as coordinator of the European Consortium are currently um, promoting. Thank you so much, uh, George Ubas from EAD to you. Uh, I will now give the floor to Michael Gable from the Uni European University Association. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Eba. And um, probably I follow up on what George just outlined uh, with a slightly different twist, probably also due to the perspective. Uh, EUA is representing more than 800 universities across Europe, very diverse. The majority are universities, some are open universities. We also have university colleges among our members. And we just conducted um, a larger survey on the state of play of digitally enhanced learning, and I will post the link afterwards. So looking at that, so I think I can confirm that we have made some progress when it comes to MOOCs, but also to short courses. George pointed to that. I can't really see it in the number of institutions that provide MOOCs or short courses, but in probably in the, in the quantity that they provided, and in particular in the way how they are used. Um, so uh, compared to 2014, when we conducted an, a similar study, we can see that the recognition of, for example, MOOC learning has, has been improved. It's much more recognized nowadays. And I think also uh, the use has become clearer. I mean, what George just said about um, lifelong learning, I wouldn't say that it is everywhere there, but at least the intention is there. And the... Uh, the opportunities are, uh, there's much more awareness for the opportunities and also for the need, I think, for the pressure uh, to provide, for example, to the labor market. But that's, of course, only one, uh, one way of understanding open education. But also, and that's at least equally important, outreach to society, the so-called third mission. If we look then on how institutions do that, and I think that's that's then an interesting uh, story. I mean, what are the structures within the institutions that, that bring that forward? How central is, for example, the lifelong learning mission to the institution? And that's, I think, where we, we might not be yet fully there. Looking then also on how open education and uh, open educational resources are used within the institution. We know from our survey that 80% have a repository. That was already the case in 2014. Uh, so a re repository for learning materials. But uh, how they are exactly used within the institution or beyond the institution, I actually don't know. How good are they? How, how, how much benefit do they actually bring for the members? for the institution, of the institution, um, the teachers, those responsible for teaching. 
we had ex actually expect that the COVID crisis, where everybody was forced to pivot to go online without uh, much warning time, that this would have boosted um, the use and reuse of uh, open uh, education uh, resources. But I'm not, not sure that we have really seen that. And um, so I just wonder whether we are still actually in a situation where you have a faculty culture also where sharing is not necessarily the norm. Um, a colleague said... Uh, uh, express that by saying, well, faculty members rather share a toothbrush than the, the than than a course. Um, well, I, I don't know if that if that is true, but uh, I know that from various um, calls where you look at proposals for institutions which provide, they they all agree to provide open uh, educational resources and to share them with others. But what you actually find very rarely is that an institution or an individual teacher says, "I'm not developing this myself. I'm I'm using something which has already existed." So I think that's what I try to say here: is how far is that actually mainstreamed uh, the open education and the open educational resources? How far has that become? Um, a strategy of the institution. And there, I think, we are not quite there. And I think as a proof, I would see um, that it doesn't play a major role in my work. So I'm working with the university leadership, and we are not discussing a lot about open educational resources. There's a lot of discussion on open science and on access to research, but I can't see a similar discussion on open education or open educational resources. So I would say, how it looks from my side, it's much more popular uh, than it was some years ago. We made some progress on certain formats of open education provision, um, but we haven't, may not have found uh, a, a sea change yet in uh, the open education in that it is not uh, really part of the institutional strategy. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael from e EUA. So uh, next, um, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Eva Sandon. She is the Vice President from UCAN, the European um, University Continuing Education uh, Network. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Uh, and many greetings from Berlin. I was just seeing uh, voices or like writings from around the world. So um, I'm grateful to be here. And also, um, well, picking up actually the idea from Michael of University Lifelong Learning, which is the core of the International Association I'm here uh, today. And um, I would maybe start uh, with uh, this idea that university lifelong learning is something that goes beyond what we call maybe continuing education or like professional programs, like a small part of, of universities, but more than the idea of having structures for lifelong learning, for opening up for different um, learners who come back in different phases of their lives. So I think that is something that we and you can try to um, enhance and to look at. So um, I think that what we look at is the learning opportunities, the services and the research that we have for the personal and the professional development of a wide range of individuals and also for communities in the region. So with a very broad understanding, knowing across Europe and beyond the understanding of lifelong learning at university is quite broad. What um, for us is important, and I think that is also um, the these are also the two focuses we have at UCAN, and without which I would like to share is that we have both this I would say policy level and and where we talk about open educational resources or also open educational practices on European level um, when it's about going. On policies, I think that's one part. But the other hand is uh, the other part is how we promote and advance lifelong learning within um, higher education institutions within Europe. So, 
what we try to do is mostly to work uh, on on open education and open education resources via projects. I think that's something that Eden does also, um, um, and also um, and also EAD, EAD, at EAD. DTU. So um, we try to do a lot of pro uh, projects um, where we try to uh, work with different universities across Europe. And I think we have to, uh, two parts. One is uh, the issue of providing open educational resources, which is one central part of our work with universities. But the other way is um, the open education practices we share that means the way how we work together and this is something that is a bit against the grain what Michael was saying like saying we can learn from each other especially on international level we can see together what is the problem how we work with it how we act and how we reflect together and how we collaboratively develop designs um, topics toolboxes rep repositories and things like that. So I, th I would say um, this is something very central to us. With regard to the last year and actually the developments we can see, I think one issue that we at the moment are very concerned about is how we can open up um, also in our way we 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 uh, have our conferences our webinars how we can work together virtually i think this is something that has very much to do on uh, on um, uh, european projects where mostly you you work together face to face meeting in different countries which we can't do and one of our uh, projects um, we have at the moment is called one it's about having one face-to-face -face meeting and let's see if we have this <laughs> in these two years we are we are going to have that where we're really trying out how we can use open educational resources for working together virtually how we share platforms um, which tools we use how we can find ways to work together uh, in a sense not missing this emotional face-to-face -face and cultural part but also how we can um, share together um, also work in a European way together so I think this is something I would like to share so how open educational practices and also the way of virtual collaboration thanks uh, thank you so much uh, Eva and you uh, can very good so um, I will now invite um, Anil Fasina from the ICDE the International Council for Open and Distance uh, Education so the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on, on where you are uh, in the world today. Uh, and greetings from ICDE. Uh, needless to say, looking at, uh, at the introductions in the, in the chat line, it's incredibly humbling to be here with uh, so many esteemed colleagues, literally from around the world. And so while I am in Western Canada, uh, working on, on my, uh, my morning coffee, for those of you that are at the end of your day, uh, and for uh, the Secretariat and the home of uh, ICDE in Norway, uh, just uh, an acknowledgement that ICDE is, is truly a, a global organization with a, a proud history of promoting inclusive, affordable, and a inclusive, affordable access, pardon me, to, to quality education. And, and needless to say, when it's part of uh, your title as the International Council for Open and Distance Education, it's fair to say that the concept of open is core to who we are. Uh, and I say that because we've got uh, 190 institutional members uh, from over 70 countries, 40 different languages. So you can imagine the number of variations of, of open education, open research, open uh, resources, open research that we start to see among uh, many of our members. And so many of those members have come to understand the power of open in creating social, cultural, and, and economic change, uh, not only in, in their specific region, but in regions around the world. Uh, in some cases, uh, our members are working on the absolute forefront of digital and, and using digital technologies to be able to create that open experience. And yet in others, we've got members that are still that are working on pen and paper and, and acknowledging that reliability of uh, electricity and connectivity just just isn't there. And yet in others, uh, we've got hybrid or blended or so many different forms. 
And as as many that are tuned in today will will recognize, I mean, COVID has has highlighted uh, the many divides uh, that that we've been tackling or trying to tackle through through open education, open research, open resources. But it's also highlighted. Uh, some of our blind spots, some of those pieces that we didn't know, those pieces that we weren't aware of in our own knowledge, even for those that uh, that were uh, in our minds, kind of at the forefront of of trying to create open environments. And so, like like many others, we've witnessed the the word open uh, adapt over time from a focus on access to elements that include open educational resources, practices, research. And so many other facets of open education and, and the global pandemic has really forced us to question some of our assumptions that we, we end up working with. Uh, but nevertheless, it, you know, this concept of open remains a core theme uh, for ICDE and, and it's uh, a core element of where we're heading here in, in our 21 to 24 uh, strategy through things, uh, you know, as Ebba had mentioned, she's, she's on uh, the ICDE OER Advocacy Committee. Uh, which has moved from recommendation now towards implementation and and trying to make sure that we're actually able to share those practices. Uh, as, as an international council, our hope is to bring people together to share those best practices, create networks and enable and empower our members to be able to develop, uh, utilize and grow the education. And I think what I want to be able to, to potentially focus on a little bit this morning is is what a couple of the other panelists have have alluded to, and that is a, a deep seated culture, and kind of tackling the question of if if people have a hard time arguing against the concept of open, and whether or not it be open access, open educational resources, open research, open practice, anything related to the the openness of education, if if it's socially progressive, if it's if it's accept, acceptable then why are we still having a challenge? Why are we still struggling? Why are we still having to advocate on a global scale for it? And, and one of the things that I want to highlight is actually, in part, we're actually going against a couple thousand years of cultural history, right? Where over time, the higher education environment has, has created almost a, a, a supply curve based on, uh, on scarcity. We've created, we've created uh, this this perception that elitism is based on the fact that you managed to get in, and and I think this uh, the, um, uh, the the COVID pandemic crisis has actually highlighted the fact that we actually need to culturally shift to a new race. It's not a race to uh, elitism. It's not a race to scarcity. It has to be a race to quality. It has to be a race to openness. It has to be a race to bringing education to anyone that needs it, wants it, and desires it. But as I mentioned, just in, and you know, Michael mentioned it a little bit, uh, as did um, uh, Eva. And it, it's how do we tackle that culture? How do we make it so, Michael? How do we make it so people want to share more than their toothbrush? Um, you know, it's, we we need to move to the environment where that that cultural piece is there. And I've got some some ideas, but we'll get to those during uh, during questions. So with that, Eba, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and and we can keep going on introductions. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Neil Pasina from uh, ICBE. Wonderful. So um, our next contribution uh, come from um, uh, OE Global, and that is uh, Lena uh, Patterson. She is the Vice President of the Board of Directors at Open Education Global. Uh, the floor is yours, Lena. Thank you so much, Eba. Thank you. Um, and thank you. I, I really appreciate being at this at this point in the in the row of speakers, because there have been just so many wonderful ideas shared that have really um, gotten me excited. So uh, I want to thank all of my colleagues who are on the panel as well, and and to you, Eva, for organizing this, and Sandra. So thank you so much. Um, I'm coming to you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. So while Neil is in the west, I am in the eastern time zone here. And I'm on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit um, and reconciliation with our Indigenous communities is very important um, to us here in Canada. And so um, recognizing the land which I'm on, the traditional territory, is, is a part of my practice. Uh, so OE Global, though, is a member-based global nonprofit organization supporting development and use of open education around the world. And it is in my capacity as vice president of the board of directors um, for OE Global that I'm here with you today. 
Uh, OE Global has hundreds of member organizations um, from a variety of different sectors, primary, secondary, nonprofit, consortia, government, cultural organizations, corporate enterprise, tech, technical, vocational colleges, universities. So we have a really wonderful diversity um, of, of membership, all convening around this idea of open education. And it is actually OE Global's convening power, which is one of the most um, incredible parts of working um, with this organization. It's actually one of the reasons why we're here today. Open Education Week is an initiative of OE Global um, and is ju just a great uh, way to kind of convene and, and build up energy around the idea of open education. So I'm really pleased to be here to kick off Open Education Week with you as, as part of OE Global. We also, um, as part of that convening work, have Open Education Awards for Excellence. We support regional nodes in California and Central uh, America, uh, which, which allow for that energy to build around open education. And because of our global scope as an organization, we also make significant contributions to advocacy efforts, um, most recently around um, support for the UNESCO recommendation for open education. So while we have lots of challenges, I think, together um, as an open education community from an advocacy perspective, we should also be really proud of what we've managed to accomplish um, from a global perspective uh, last year with that work. So I just wanna make a quick note um, and I'm gonna share a link in the chat because o OE Global is about to embark on or is embarking on uh, a new strategic plan. And so I wanna just, before I move into my content, just quickly invite everybody here um, to contribute to the open education uh, global strategic planning process. It's a community-based process and we're really looking for your feedback. So just put that plug in there. I promised Paul I would do that. Um, so the things that I kind of want to circle back to that I heard from my colleagues are specifically about um, your first question, Abba, about collaboration and exchange of experience and how that contributes to our understanding of the benefits of open education. And as associations that deal with, um, that convene people and deal with conversations and getting people together around those conversations and building momentum, I think collaboration, especially on an international stage, is absolutely critical to the global open education movement because it is a model of sustainability and connection which provides the foundation on which we can begin to address problems that are global in scope and global in impact. And I love what George was talking about, about the potential to explore connections between the emerging skills-based economy and the future of open education and the role of lifelong learning uh, as it connects into that conversation. And not just as it as it pertains to the demographic that we traditionally think of as students. A couple of the other panelists have pointed to um, lifelong learning for people who are currently working. I really wanna focus our attention on uh, lifelong learning for educators and lifelong learning to, in support of open education for educators. As Michael said, you know, the toothbrush analogy, that really, um, I've never heard that before, but. That's a good one um, because it really it really crystallizes for us what we're up against in terms of the culture, uh, the many generations of culture that Neil referred to that the open education community is kind of um, shoving up against and sometimes has conflict with. So I really think that uh, tr training and support of lifelong learning of our educators um, in open education and open pedagogy and open practice is a key linchpin to success and, and future sustainability for us. And if we think about that on a global perspective, from a collaborative perspective, we have so much to contribute. So I'm just going to end on that and um, hand it back over to you, Eva. So oh, thank you so much, Elena Patterson from um, uh, OE Global. Wonderful. And yes, it was good that you mentioned that uh, OE Global is really the host and the initiator from the, for the OE week, started many years ago. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Lena. Uh, our next uh, contributor is, um, is um, from UNESCO, uh, Zeynep Varaglou. 
and she is uh, especially responsible for the UNESCO OER Dynamic Coalition. So the floor is yours, uh, Zainab, and I think you will share some slides with us. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, I am just start sharing. I think you can see me on the slides at the same time. Um, thank you very much for the floor and thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak at this event. It's really fascinating to hear the different perspectives from the panelists that came before. I will just be speaking now from the perspective of an intergovernmental organization and a, and a normative instrument that's been established for OER in 2019. And I have slides and I'll go through them, but I think it'll just kind of maybe uh, provide some images to go with the words. So a lot of you already know what UNESCO is, but just in case, it's uh, it was established over in 1945. We have 193 member states and, um, and we are based in Paris and we have field offices in over 50 countries in all world regions. Looks like this, our building. And this is where we work. So basically everywhere except on the Ant Antarctic. And so we, our, our reach is global and we actually do have, do, and we work with the member states on this. The reason or everything we do is based on uh, two commitments, one to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in that Article 19, which um, outlines the right to receive and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers. And of course, 26, which is the right to education. And then UNESCO's constitution, which is a commitment to the free exchange of ideas and knowledge and supports sharing of knowledge using technologies. Now, I'd just like to point out something. Those statements were written in the 40s, before there was internet, before there was anything really in terms of technology aside from the telephone and maybe um, some other similar technologies. And I think it is really the bottom, the beginning of open education, if you like, because it was really very uh, forward thinking and it's still relevant. So um, it's, when you think about it, I, I find it quite surprising anyway. So what is the UNESCO recommendation? What am I talking about? Why are we making such a big deal about this? Well, because there aren't that many and because they are um, soft law, but effective law. UNESCO has three types of normative instruments, standard setting instruments, instruments, basically laws. So you have conventions, which some of you may know very well, because I think many, uh, everybody is from the higher education field for the most part. And you've heard of the uh, convention on the recognition of qualifications, which allows for students to have their qualifications from one country re recognized, hopefully in another country. And a recommendation is the second level, which is much, which is not as, uh, as it's not as um, stiff as a convention. It doesn't require countries to actually sign or ratify, but it is still uh, something. And then there are declarations. A recommendation is semantically what it says. It recommends countries to do something. So you're thinking, what's the big deal? I recommend some, I recommend cheese with your bread, big deal. It's works much, it's a bit more than that, if you like, because it actually is a recommendation that countries take into account a certain subject and put it into the vocabulary of their policy talks. And they do it forever because recommendations don't go away. So every four years, there is a reporting on this. So um, this is, um, this is the process that went through. It was like, it was painful. Every time you see like a little golden halo, it means that 193 member states said yes to the idea that was presented and to go forward. Twice they said yes. And the third time, the second time they did that, they actually agreed to every single word and comma on that document. Um, in the May 2019, we had all the member states come together officially with people who were in the room that said that they were representing their country. So whatever they said is what the country said, basically to be just outright with it. And they agreed to every single word. And then they, uh, and then this was adopted and agreed upon in the general conference. So this is a document which has member state backing, government backing. What does it look like? Looks like this. You can look it up, go into, look up legal instruments 
when you search for legal instruments, UNESCO OER recommendation 2019. Here you have a slide which you can't see and it's kind of on purpose, but you have here one, two, about 12, one, two, three, about 12, uh, instruments. And the first one is in 1989. And those are about the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about the 10 or 12 instruments that have been agreed upon since 1989. So you see that this is not a very common thing. And so it's there, it's available in all UN languages. And what does it say? This is the part that's really interesting. Uh, it defines OER. And defining OER was a really big deal. It took a lot of discussion, debate, a lot of work. And it come, we, and this definition we can now use as what is OER. And what's really interesting now is in the COVID crisis, everybody's talking about free, but it's not free as in free pizza. It's, it's not about being free. It's about open, being open, openly licensed. And here you have something and it's really important. And we, when we did this, of course, we didn't know what was going to happen within th six months, but I think it's something that can be used by the community quite a bit to just clarify things because there has been a little bit of fuzz that's floated in during this COVID time between free and open. And free is free, open is open, it's not the same thing. And I would invite you to use this as a tool because everybody agreed to this, so we might as well use it. What's also interesting is the next thing, the stakeholders. You see how long that list is? It has, usually when you have an educational um, educational discussion or document, you have about five, six stakeholders, governments, institutions, students, associations, etc. Here we have everybody. We have also cultural institutions. We have libraries, archives. We have internet providers, infrastructure providers, because online learning really doesn't go very far if you don't have the internet which is what we've also learned over the last couple of years more than anything. And by the way, this infrastructure business, we've even learned that within a household and in a country, perhaps in the Europe region, even has problems because you have only so much bandwidth. So this is something that affects everyone. We have media broadcasting groups. We have copyright holders, which is basically anyone who's produced something. And this is what the inside looks like. And I think it leads to a lot of the discussions we had earlier. We have, there are five areas. The first one is about capacity to create, access, use, adapt, and redistribute OER. And what came out of the discussions is that OER is a great idea. And if we're going to go back to the toothpaste analogy, toothbrush analogy, we can of course go back to the fact that it's so great. It'll make your teeth brighter. You'll smell better. Everything is great, but in fact, the problem is a lot of people really have a lot of trouble actually finding them, accessing them, using them, reusing them, sharing them. It's a fact. After all of this time, it's still a challenge. So that was the first part. The second is on supportive policy. How can we, what can we do in this area? The third one is loaded. That those five, six words in that box are loaded. Inclusive re 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 refers to persons with disabilities, ensuring that it's uh, equitable to vulnerable groups, access again to, um, to uh, also to disability issues, quality. I know we're in, with higher education people, so you'll be happy I'll say the word quality assurance. So George, I remember that the first time we met, it was about quality assurance. Everybody is there, so it's there. And sustainability, what can you do to ensure the sustainability of all of the, the processes that are going through since, in fact, it's supposed to be available for no profit? So the dynamic, we've put in place a dynamic coalition, which responds to the fifth one, which is facilitating international cooperation. And the objective of this dynamic coalition is to leverage interregional collaboration to create peer networks and to identify partnerships and mechanisms to promote and strengthen OER efforts. And what we found, we had two large meetings and we've had a number of events. And what we found is that there is a huge community out there. It's everywhere and it's, um, it's, it's really large, but there's um, a lot of people doing a lot of the similar stuff and they need to sort of kind of connect to one another in order to do it, to be able to see. 
So I have some uh, examples of some of the work that we're looking at here. I'm almost finished, so I know my time is tight. Um, my last point is this, and it applies to what are we doing? How can the collaboration be useful? What can this all feed into? And it's the fact that we put out a joint call for action. And basically we called for people to remember, for governments to remember that OER is out there and it should be used and it should be harnessed and it should be a mainstay of the response to the educational crisis that came out of the COVID, um, COVID crisis. So um, I think we're going to address the three questions, two questions after, so I won't go too much into it, but the collaboration and exchange, I think is at the heart of the OER. And in terms of supporting learners, well, it's contextualization. That's the point of OER. And I think that's the point, that's the point that has to be really put forward in a manner which is going to really uh, be effective in order for it to work. So with that, thank you. Uh, you have my email there if you'd like more information and uh, what else? And I'll get out of here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Seinep uh, from UNESCO, the dynamic uh, OER condition for OER. Wonderful. I think this uh, recommendation is really, really helpful and really, really support our, our job uh, very, very much. And I saw in the chat as well that uh, Catherine, for example, she's always using that when she is working on the disseminating in the work on OER and it's really helpful. Uh, let me just see. Um, I wonder if we have Ashka Kanva with us. You do, um, Eva. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Uh, I'll just take five minutes. You just came right in time, Ashka, Asha, and you're so much welcome. Uh, Asha Kanva is coming from the Commonwealth of Learning where she is the president. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I was just listening to the last bit. I'm sorry, you know, my office seems to have got the time wrong, but it's lovely to see everyone and looking well and safe. Just to share with you, you know, five uh, uh, initiatives that we, the Commonwealth of Learning took under the COVID crisis to support our stakeholders. And then I'll end with five lessons. So it shouldn't take more than four or five minutes. Uh, the first is the OER for COVID. And in fact, it links very well with what Zainab was just saying, because it complements, uh, you know, the higher level policy making that UNESCO does with actual work on the ground. So that one of them was OER for COVID. Uh, this was promoting OER based online learning. This we started last April, you know, when COVID had just started with the OER Foundation in New Zealand. And this was achieving three objectives. It was a support network for educators. It was sharing online courses, providing open IT tools and building the capacity of educators. And there were people from about 89 countries who joined this uh, network and the platform is still going very strong. So this has been a very practical way of uh, supporting people almost immediately. But, you know, in some regions of the Commonwealth where we work in 54 member states in the Pacific, the connectivity is really a problem. So the ministers asked us to develop a video on demand, a video on demand facility, which requires low bandwidth. So we've done this for four countries, Fiji, Nauru, Samoa and Tonga. And over 800 videos were curated which were aligned to their curriculum. So this they found very useful because it's sort of linked with what the teachers really needed. We've also done a lot of capacity building that Zainab was talking about, you know, using MOOCs. Uh, for example, uh, we've done technology. This was the biggest thing that teachers needed, you know, technology integration, um, the ability to use OER for online learning and so on. And the government of Trinidad and Tobago asked us to run a MOOC. And you know, they've got 17,000 teachers. Half the number of teachers in the country were trained through that MOOC. We've also been doing MOOCs on cybersecurity training for teachers, which is very popular. So it's happening again and again. And the point to say is that all the content is available as OER, which means anybody can run with it. You, know, you can adapt it to your context and you can use it. We also developed a lot of OER resources during this time. For example, you know, um, teaching in a digital age with Tony Bates, you know, these are videos 
which in just 12 videos give you a full, and this is for policymakers and practitioners, give you a full idea of what you need to do in terms of quality, in terms of student support, in terms of delivery, in terms of assessment and so on. And there were several other uh, resources which were created uh, for this time, you know, which are all OER strategies for uh, blended TVET, for gender, for um, distance education, for assistive technologies and so on. So all those resources are available as OER on our website. Plus we also uh, initiated a partnership um, called Open Door where 60 plus uh, organizations, universities mostly, and associations and networks have joined. And they have shared all the partners and MIT is one of them, have all uh, shared about 200 online courses as OER for any other partner to use. So, I mean, these are very sort of useful resources which actually complement uh, the bigger initiatives being taken by our uh, partners and stakeholders el elsewhere. So I think the five lessons that we've learned in this time is that we are all interdependent and interconnected that the COVID has shown us. And I think this builds a very strong foundation for further collaboration and sharing. We already have a lot of collaboration with each other, as you know, but this is the foundation to strengthen it further. The second lesson we've learned is that there are declining investments in education, especially in two thirds of the developing low income and middle income countries in the world. So I think OER becomes, um, a very important and viable option for governments as they take this forward with lower uh, resources. And so there would be a need for increased advocacy for OER and of course, evidence-based. The other mo uh, momentum that we've seen during this pandemic is self-directed learning. You know that the number of MOOCs people have done during this time. So self-directed learning has come up and this actually lays the foundation for lifelong learning. So more OER for lifelong learning going forward. The digital divides have become, as we've seen, wider than ever social inequalities have increased. And especially women and persons with disabilities are going to be further disadvantaged. So how do we sort of invest in more accessible and affordable OER? And then finally, if we are talking about, you know, building back better, which everybody's talking about, Capacity in OER, developing, using, and sharing OER will be something which will be very, very important going forward. So with that, thanks a lot. Eva, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Asha Kambar from Commonwealth of Learning. Wow, this is uh, really uh, wonderful. It has been a wonderful hour to listen to all of you in the distinguished panel. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, and it's also wonderful to hear what uh, each of you and each of the organizations are doing, uh, but also what and how we can work together. And that is uh, one of the uh, one of the aim uh, for this session as well. I mean, we work together in different kind of um, uh, issues, of course, but it's so, so great to have everyone on board uh, today all together. There has been, um, so thank you very, very much for uh, all contributors uh, in the panel. It was wonderful. And also thanks a lot. It has been a really lovely, um, lively um, discussion and sharing uh, in the chat I have seen. I have tried to follow and I also have my colleague uh, Diana following it. So we will keep on track. Um, I will uh, start off with, um, uh, by the way, Asha, I know that you have to leave rather soon, so please uh, just do it when when you find it uh, possible, uh, when you need to do it. So thanks for being with us. Um, anyway, there have been some questions and the discussions and sharing a lot of links in, in the chat so far, and also some questions uh, in the question and answers. So I will uh, start off with that, and then um, we also have some common uh, questions for you or for us from Ida. But I will start with a discussion in the in the chat. And I will start with Sir John Daniel, who is together with us today. And it's really, really a, an honor that you are here today. Sir John Daniel was also the founder of Eden. 
So thank you for the time for, for being with us. And one of his questions is about um, how are the commercial publishers adapting to the success of OER and are their adaptations helpful or harmful? That was a very tricky question. So who will get started with this one? Uh, Zainab? Yes, I don't, hello, Sir John. It's a great honor to, to be here with you. Uh, he was also our big boss at UNESCO. Uh, Sir John was the Assistant Director General for Education at UNESCO also. Um, I don't know exactly how all commercial publishers are doing. I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure, but I do know that they're interested in discussion because when we organized the first meeting of the OER Dynamic Coalition, we invited the Association of Publishers and they came and it was the uh, it was the NGO, and it was also the regional uh, some of the European publishing associations. And to be uh, to be just concise, there were a lot of very um, constructive and open uh, movements towards dialogue and to see how we can work together and how there can there was a there was a desire that was actually quite clear that to co cooperate and to collaborate. So I think it's a promising point. Uh, thank you, Zainab. Someone else would like to take that question? So Ebba, I can uh, uh, take it a little bit if, if you'd like. Yes, please. Uh, so thanks, uh, Sir John, for, for the question. And, and I think if, if you're amenable, I'm gonna pull it back just half a level to suggest that the question actually needs to be able to tackle not only the, uh, the, the commercial publishers, but also it has to involve a, a conversation with the content creators, right? So for those, for those people that are involved in the creation of, of open educational resources, they willingly create an environment where they're publishing it in a, in a common domain, they're, they're willing for other people to use, uh, reuse, etc. cetera. Um, and yet in, in other uh, context, some content creators are also involved in the conversation around copyright, right? So whether or not, you know, institutions are using materials uh, for learning purposes uh, under, under certain jurisdictional um, uh, regulations. And so there, there has to actually be a larger conversation between the learner, the institution, the content creator, and the publishers that are involved in this. And I think, you know, to Zainab's uh, point, a number of those commercial, uh, commercial publishers will come to the table uh, because they're, they're looking for the solution on the, on the, on the tail end as well, right? I mean, they have a commercial enterprise they're trying to protect. They are responsible to a group of people. And so if they're able to work into that conversation and, and we can find that path to be able to create an environment where people are willing to create, use, reuse, and, and obviously not commercialize when it comes to open, uh, the environment uh, becomes much more problem solving and, and solution creation as compared to uh, ending up in, in what is an inevitable um, potential regulatory or legal uh, contest. Uh, as, as the gray line between OER, copyright, commercial uh, publishing, and, and the creator start to play out, all with the students sitting at the center, right? So it becomes, it's, it's, it's an awesome question because the complexities that sit uh, within that question uh, are immense and actually have to be one of those cultural things that we, we look to be able to dismantle if we want to find ultimate success and open. Thank you, Neil. Uh, anyone else? Okay, I have here a question from uh, Anna Torren. Uh, dear panelists, uh, do we use research showing that the use of OER in higher education is successful? Uh, is that this research perhaps showing that if university staff reuse learning objects for the course, they might um, free up time that they can use for the students' learning? Uh, what I'm after is the question teachers mainly mainly ask themselves, why should I care about OER? Uh, although I think uh, each of you have answered that question in your, um, in your talks, but um, I, I also know that uh, all of us uh, used to get at this question on the floor, why should I care? 
Who would like to take that one? I can start, Ava. Um, yes. I, I, I just I want to start just by saying that I think that the answer to that question is as individual as every educator, um, you know, that that comes to that question. So I, I don't think that there is a universal answer to that question. And it will really depend on the circumstances in which that educator finds themselves. However, I do think that there is um in general, a, a, a universal concern for the for the well being of the student, um, and I think that is a I, I think that could be a common denominator that is really important to answering that question if there was one across the board. And one of the ways that um, I was just putting this in the chat, one of the ways that we we can achieve that is through focus on research that continually tries to investigate um, and center inquiry around the connection between an open educational resource and the well-being or social mobility of our students, um, no matter where they find themselves. And I think that that we need, there's lots of great work that's been done in that space, but it needs to continue and it needs to continue to be the main question that, that we ask because Every time there's a there's a global shift like the one we just experienced with COVID, we need to be able to produce that research again, and it needs to be relevant based on those shifts that we're seeing um, that that happen so quickly. Um, and so, building up a, a community, a strong community, a strong baseline of research that that centers around that question and continues to to probe in that direction as you know, every year as an as an annual cycle, as a matter of course, I think will be really, really important. So there might be people um, in the chat or in in on uh, the other panels who will be able to direct the the um, person who asked the question to such a place. Um, I don't know uh, off the top of my head where that would be, but I just wanted to make that general call for the for the importance of continued inquiry around that around that question and continued inquiry from all corners of the globe around that question. Uh, thank you so much, Elena. Uh, Sandra? Yeah, I, I would like to, to I, I agree with Lena, but I would like to say um, why we get such questions, uh, why teachers need to ask such questions. I would say that uh, it is obligation of the institution, uh, but also of the, the Ministry of the Education uh, to provide uh, all necessary uh, information and, and training of teachers so that they do not come with such questions. It is the same if they ask, why do should I use digital technologies? Why should I use open education? Um, I'm happy that we at Eden uh, for work as a community of practice and for all those teachers who, who want to, to learn new things, we are here with the, uh, our activities to provide the floor to get the information as added value to already uh, basic information uh, as they have. But I think uh, it's a pity that teachers do have uh, to ask such questions because they should uh, get the already training and answers at their own institution uh, before even asking uh, what, is it, what is it for me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sandra, for this um, uh, this answer or this reflection. And that brings me, of course, to you, Michael. <laughs> Sorry that I direct you uh, so so um, in that way, but you said in in your um, initial speech about that actually this is not really a concern for higher education, and um, maybe that is uh, why we get this question all the time. Uh, exactly what yeah. is. What <clears throat> Yeah, no, and I would have anyhow asked for responding to Sandra because I do not fully agree <coughs> with with what she said, and I think there is indeed, um, if if you look at um, the results that we get to surveys, you can see that there is some um, uncertainty about some of the advantages. You brought the example of digitally enhanced learning, for example. So if if we follow the responses that we get from institutions throughout the years, so there are some acknowledged benefits. Uh, everybody agrees across Europe that it helps to trigger a discussion on learning and teaching in institutions. But if you raise the question, um, does it help to 
enhance student-centered learning? Does it help teachers to have more time at hands to support students individually? The answers are less certain. Sometimes it's something that is solved by time. When we raised the question on the flipped classroom in 2014, people were very uncertain about it, probably also due to a lack of definition what that actually would be. Yeah. Where some years down the road then we see it's 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 used, it's embraced, and people see it works and it might bring some benefits. But I think in particular now, post in the post-COVID situation, um somebody asked before, I think it was Andras. Uh, what, what have we learned from the crisis, you know, and what will be the push in the future? Because when, when it started, I mean, nobody was happy about the crisis, but some people said it's actually a good crisis to get out into new ways of, of working. It pushed for digitally enhanced learning and an end. And some even said we might leapfrog a few stages and might make a huge, uh, a huge progress. That's actually true. But at the same time, and the longer this takes, um, there is also considerable pressure to go back to campus and to the old ways of teaching, being in the classroom with the students and then and yeah. So we will have a very mixed picture within your institution, and I think you have to be con you have to be ready to um, stand the argument and a discussion. Is that really better learning online and? Of course, nobody can say yes or no, and it's not so easy to prove. So I think we will have to find good arguments, and it needs this kind of research. And I think particularly at institutions where, where you have this scholarship of learning and teaching, and people understand more and reflect more on the ways on how you teach at your institution. I mean, if you look into the academic literature, there are all kinds of, of, of case studies, yeah, uh, what somebody taught a class somewhere, but you never understand fully all conditions and they might be different conditions than yours and your learners might also have different needs. So I think it's really important that we keep on asking these questions and probably also try to answer them at the institutions. Governments might not be of much help there. They can probably fund it or support it in other ways, but the work has to be done at the institutions. But I think it also goes back to uh, one of the slides that you showed uh, saying that, that there are so many stakeholders involved and each of us, each of them need to be involved. It's not, it, it's not just a one-man show and not just a, a question for teachers. I think if I just may add that uh, there has been growing awareness on this now, but I mean, you still find policy discussions where there's talk about uh, student teachers and uh, solving a problem of quality of learning and teaching is usually get the teachers trained. Nobody looks at what it would actually take um, for teaching. It's, you, you can run an analogy of a hospital. If you just think that you need a surgeon to perform surgery, uh, very dangerous approach. Yeah, And I think in education, it's quite similar. You know, It needs all these colleagues who are in student services, who are in the administration, who plan and support it. And in the end, it will need the institutional leadership as well to make the point that this is important. And that goes, I think, for digitally enhanced learning as well, and certainly also for open education. You need to see the whole ecosystem of uh, education and learning, true. I think we have time for one question more, and there is one from um, uh, Catherine Conan. Um, in your experiences, uh, what are effective ways of leveraging the broader understanding of open science, open access, to further awareness of open education, OER, OEP, particularly among higher education policymakers and leaders? It was also a nice question. Anyone who would like to take that one? Well, maybe, uh, I, 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 maybe I can connect it also to the former, former question because the former topic in how much are the universities um, uh, open for for change and having their their uh, training change and so on. Uh, the policy level is important here as well. And I just want to uh, point out that we are um, uh, looking at, at the institutional level. The change is is maybe not that that quick as um, Michael Gable is indicating. 
uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of drivers in society that would ask for uh, for this change. Uh, looking at the, um, uh, the, the the change in the economy, uh, digitalization of the economy, longer careers of people ask for uh, continued education, upskilling and reskilling. But for that, you need to have uh, flexible, scalable, accessible uh, offerings, which are online uh, online offerings. And um, the knowledge uh, uh, contained in these online offerings are part of the knowledge centers the universities are. So it is actually kind of a, a uh, you could see it as, as a task of making that knowledge available by the universities, by um, uh, bringing them also in, in, online, um, in online modes. This is going to take time for, uh, to, to develop for the coming years and therefore open education at this moment there are many resources available online resources which are not um, uh, taken because uh, they are not uh, known well or they are not categorized well they have to be uh, brought into what is the, the current demand continuing education are short programs and building uh, from the existing MOOCs and new MOOCs uh, other uh, open education resources building programs that are fit for the for the economy for the uh, companies and, and the sectors uh, in, a, in a dialogue to make them fit is actually a task that uh, has to be has to be taken up um, to to um, to deliver on on the demand which is currently there uh, thank you so much uh, George so um we are almost coming to the end of uh, this uh, session and webinar, so I will share my screen again. <laughs> it has really been a wonderful uh, discussion and uh, debate uh, and a lot of questions and reflections uh, during this webinar with all our great uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, from uh, those eight uh, global associations. And um, I will really say that um, to my mind, I mean, the, the message from all of you uh, are in the same kind of directions with some kind of different kind of pathways, uh, but uh, the messages, messages is very, very clear from all of you. And maybe that uh, <clears throat> will come to a position that if we really take the position that education is common good and should be reachable and available to all, it is our obligation to join efforts and work in these directions. And as we have been discussed and what very much uh, Sena pointed out, um, and all of you are actually OER and the wide meaning of OER, I don't mean just the resources, but if we really take the recommendation and really take the recommendation seriously, uh, can help in achieving inclusive education, aiming to ensure that learners with diverse needs and preferences, uh, even with disabilities, have equal opportunities in accessing learning resources, services, and learning experiences in general. So maybe some, some kind of statement and um, um, final conclusion is about that international associations support openness in education, research, and in life as it is uh, culture that will enable us all to equally participate in life we were given. And I think all of you have really um, uh, approached uh, those dimensions. And I know that we are more or less running out of time, but maybe a question to reflect on is about, um, uh, so in short, um, what are the actions which are needed to, to uh, really achieve this at governmental level, at institutional level, and at member level. And I know that uh, we all, and you all, uh, within your organizations are working on this. Uh, so maybe I would like to, um, to give the floor to you, Sandra, as the pres president of Eden. Uh, in your opinion and uh, in your statements, how do you think we can proceed forward with it, this uh, after this um, very, very exciting and very uh, unique opportunity that we all have met together for this webinar, sharing our experiences and resources and knowledge? 
Thank you, Eva. Uh, well, time has passed really, really uh, uh, quite quickly, and it was really interesting to see uh, and hear uh, the opinions from the others, and really questions have been uh, great. We could talk for hours uh, about this topic, definitely, and there is a uh, need to, for, for much more talking uh, ab about this issue. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the association has important voice uh, and uh, we have behind us a number of members. Uh, we have behind us knowledge and expertise of our members. And uh, by joining our efforts, we can push uh, stronger messages, uh, stronger results and stronger initiatives towards uh, making uh, open education uh, more visible and more present. Uh, we have seen today that uh, still uh, open education and open education resources are an issue because we still have questions, what is it for, what is, is it in it for me? And uh, definitely the crisis have enhanced uh, the, the, the need uh, that everyone has access accessibility uh, for education. Um, and uh, what we want is that uh, uh, we enrich our society with people which are educated because only educated people can enhance the social and economic impact of their countries. And if we want our students, our people to be skilled, uh, to be uh, able to make changes in the future, then we have to uh, make everything in our efforts uh, to provide possibility that they get uh, all the possible uh, education they get, uh, whether it's the information they will find on the internet, the, whether it will be some discussion in which they will participate, whether it will be some research they will participate or just read it, or the, whether is it a formal education where they have some uh, diploma, or uh, as we see now, the short courses have become much more uh, present and needed because special, I would say, of this uh, online uh, way of uh, working. So there's definitely a need that we enhance that. And I think that by prom not promoting, but by disseminating uh, information and pushing uh, the information much stronger, we can influence uh, on, in our country, on our, uh, our country level, uh, the visibility of importance of open education, but also we can influence uh, the uh, associations like uh, UNESCO, like European Commission, like European Universities Association and others to put on the agenda, the issue of open education and to much stronger advocate uh, the need uh, uh, for that. And uh, definitely in Eden, we will foster these activities and we'll come back to you and ask you to join us in our further efforts uh, to make uh, open education and openness as a way of culture of, uh, in, our life, in our society, not just as a trend, uh, perhaps in education and research. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I think this is really important that you mentioned and stressed the, the culture of openness that each of us need to advocate about that and also to be have been influencer and to advocate in each of our uh, context or this or activities we, we are working on. Uh, because to, and also this uh, webinar really has shown very uh, obviously that uh, we are on the same kind of track and together we are very strong and that's um, uh, Aisha Kamba, for example, mentioned that uh, their campaign has been open doors, and I know that uh, many of the organizations have had their own campaigns, not at least during the, the COVID-19 uh, in 2020. Like Eden, we had a, um, um, uh, open together, uh, where we had a series of webinars, uh, both in spring and in autumn, and uh, of course, we will continue, and we really hope that you were also saying, Sandra, that we can um, do some more work in collaboration together with all of you to move things uh, forward. Uh, so by that, I think it is uh, time to, um, first of all, uh, thank all the panelists, all the distinguished uh, uh, panelists and, the, and your contributions uh, for taking your time and for your interest and uh, being together with us uh, for today. And as I said in the beginning, it really showed also the importance because when I approached you, uh, all of you more or less said, yes, thank you, uh, more or less uh, with a, 
uh, returning emails. So it's very, very fantastic that we can manage to do this together. <clears throat> I also would like to thank all the participants uh, and the this webinar is recorded, so you will get the link afterwards, of course, and we will continue the dialogue, continue the di discussion, and continue our uh, advocacy about uh, the role of openness in shaping the, the future, the future we want. And that goes very much hand in hand with UNESCO's initiative for, for 2050, uh, <clears throat> the futures of education, learning to become. Although it is maybe some 30 years to 2050, we have to start uh, more or less now, or yesterday, preferable. So um, we have a, more sessions with the Eden Open Educational Week. It continues already tomorrow. And then it goes uh, each of the days, and some days there are even two um, webinars. And you can, of course, find those um, uh, at Eden webpage, and you can register for all at one time, if you like. So please uh, continue to be together with us, uh, not just for this week, but also for the future. But uh, this week is very, very uh, much of interest. And I know there's a lot of interesting other sessions as well at um, uh, the Open Education Week. So please um, uh, join and uh, please uh, learn together. <coughs> and our next uh, uh, conference from Eden, Eden 2021, will be a virtual annual conference and it will be hosted by UNED in uh, Madrid, in Spain. Uh, the call is out, and um, you can find more information here as well uh, at our webpage. So by that, I would like to thank you all again uh, very much for your time and for your contribution and for your interest. And please uh, stay in touch. Uh, and also please uh, uh, stay safe and take care and stay healthy. And um, we'll be in touch. Have a nice evening, morning, afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, thank you.